Well, good morning, everybody. We are wrapping up uh, a series on worship today. So glad you are here. Uh, before we get into that, um, man, a lot of great things happening at LifeGate. Heart for the House begins next month. Something special that begins this week is Connect, uh, is groups. And this is a way for you to connect, to get into a smaller environment where you can build relationships, where uh, discipleship can happen. And there's lots of ways for you to find out about that. You can use your app. If you open up your LifeGate app on the bottom, there's a tab that says Grow. Click on that, and then it has all the groups listed that are happening. And then uh, we're here, and ask any of the staff, the team, ask somebody that you see every week. Uh, somebody is going to point you in the right direction. And here's why this is an important. Uh, discipleship and relationship doesn't happen in rows. It happens in circles. And this is one of those parts, like a lot of times the blue chair can become our destination with church. But this is not the stopping place, this is the starting place. And there is another layer of relationship and something that's needed in our lives, and, and that happens in the circle. And uh, LifeGate, we, we, uh, there's no really way you can say, you be friends with this person. Like, that doesn't work in school, you know, and it doesn't work in, in church. But there are environments that we can create where you can make friends. And uh, you need to be known. And there's people that need to know you. You are likable and lovable and somebody needs you in their life. And this is a great way for that to happen. And so maybe it's been a while since you've been in a smaller group uh, environment. Uh, maybe you never have. And it's time. And this is a part, I promise, there is something that's going to take, that happens in groups that takes your life to another level. And so uh, we just want to invite you to be a part of that, prioritize it and make time. And then uh, let's go ahead and get into the Word of God. Man, it's been a great series. Uh, I really appreciate how Amy started it out a few weeks ago that worship is not worship unless it is centered on Jesus. It has to be about Him. If, it, if you're calling it worship and Jesus is not the center, it's not worship. It, it is something else. It might be worshiping something else, uh, but it has to be about him. And, and then we talked the next week about there should be this exchange that it's giving and receiving. If you, if you are worshiping in your life, but you're only giving something, you're not receiving, then, then we've made it transactional and not relational. And there's a difference. It's like what Amy was talking about with our giving and our tithing. It's not, it's not, it's not a business transaction with God. Everything with God is relational that he wants for us to, to exchange with him. And worship is the same way. And then uh, Pastor Tony was here last week, our founding pastors, and uh, really just emphasized the significance of uh, everything in our life is worship, but there is something special about the assembly when we gather together and what God does on a Sunday. Anybody been affected by a Sunday, by a camp, by something that happened when you got together with other people worshiping? There's just something that happens, and it's that promise. Two or three are gathered together, he's here. And I want to tell you, he's what makes this place special. He's what makes the gathering uh, special, and I so appreciate uh, that word. And, and then today, I want to wrap it up with emphasizing that, that your whole life can be worship. I'm not going to say that your whole life is worship, because... When we make everything worship, I'm going to kind of create some tension here just for a moment, but then I'm going to resolve it, so don't worry. But if everything's worship, then nothing's worship. And what I mean by that is if, if we just go on automatic and say, well, you know, when I brush my teeth, that's worship, and then when I get dressed, that's worship, and I cut the grass. Anybody cut the straight lines in the grass? And then you redo it if there's a crooked line, yeah. And, and then, you know, my, my, my grass is worship. And, you know, when I, when I go and I root for the wrong team in Tuscaloosa uh, last night and, and they lose, you know, that's worship. And, you know, when I, when I go to lunch today at the, one of the 16 Mexican restaurants in Villa Rica and I order the nachos that tastes like all the other restaurants, you know, it, it, that's worship. And, and, and then when I go to, work, to church and I sing, that's worship. When I go to work, and you know, it's almost like it's a automatic. Well, if I'm a Christian, and everything I do is worship, but it's not automatic. <laughs> Anybody married and you have come to understand that your relationship is not automatic, it's a five speed. <laughs> There's a clutch. And if you go on automatic and you don't engage, you don't just, you don't just go in neutral, you're backing down the hill. I mean, it's like, what, what has happened? It's like, baby, I told you I loved you six years ago. Why do I need to be engaged today, you know? And, and, and so 
nothing comes automatically. I, I would just say, you know, this is not a message about automatic, but if you are automatic in your job, you better watch out. Because somebody who's not is going to be engaged at a greater speed, and they're going to pass you, and you're going to think, well, I've been here the longest, but they're actually present in their job. They're not automatic. You know, so, so it's the same thing in every part of our life. And so I just want to, like, help kind of this, this umbrella idea of worship, that worship is a song, but it's more than a song. Worship is your church attendance, but it's, but it's more than that. Worship is your private time, but it's also public time. Worship is your marriage, but it's more than your marriage. It, it is your life. And we were created to worship God. Paul describes it like this in, uh, in the New Testament. He says that our worship is like incense or a sweet smell that, that rises up to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 2.15, it says, because of Christ, everybody say that with me, because of Christ, we give off a sweet scent rising to God. It was, oh, you're saying the rest. Very good. That was, they, know, they follow instructions around here. And, and so what does that mean? Does that mean I smell better because I have a relationship because of Jesus? Yes, you should. If you smell worse because of Jesus, that's not Jesus. We smell better because of him. So our lives, and it's a metaphor, don't be sniffing your neighbor right now. You know, you don't, you don't smell better. You smell worse. This isn't like that. But, but it actually is a reference to an old setting for worship where the priest would come and they would write the incense they would actually stir incense and and it would it would rise to the Lord which is really crazy I didn't give this to the first service you're here for the second service so here you go they actually made a figure eight in in their their worship as they swung the the incense I forgot the the actual name but the incense burner so they're swinging a figure eight you know what that figure eight represents it's the name of Jesus Woo! So thousands of years before Jesus ever showed up in the, they're, they're actually doing the symbol of Jesus and it was the way they would enter God's presence because worship makes a place, makes a way for us to enter God's presence. Well, well Paul is referring to that. He says your life is actually this, you know, and we're not swinging incense around and, and that type of act, but, but he's saying your life is this aroma lifted before the Lord, is worship to him. And, and not just the way you sing on Sundays or the way you clap your hands or you, however you worship. I love LifeGate. Our culture has always been, it's not about how you worship, it's who you worship. You can worship quietly, you can worship loud. You, like, this is about him. He is the center of our worship. But I would say that about your life too, that, that the way we lead our lives, the way we serve our families, the way we love our spouses, the way we, we care for our kids, all of these things can be worship when it's not automatic, but it's intentionally lifted towards the Lord. It can be a sweet aroma that lifts up before the Lord. My lifestyle can be worship. Colossians 3, 17, again, this is Paul. He says, and whatever, everybody say whatever. You do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. So it's not, sometimes we stop. Well, whatever I do, it's worship. No, whatever you do as unto the Lord. So think about all the commands. Like all these things started coming into my mind of, okay, you obey your parents. This is to kids. Obey your parents in the Lord. Submit to your husbands. Submit to one another in the Lord. Like all of these things, it's not, woman, you better submit. Man, you better submit. No, it's submit in the Lord. Now with your kids, sometimes it's just, you better submit. <laughs> you better. And you're like, I'm going to, and it's like, what, what, what are you going to, but I'm going to. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do because I hadn't figured it out yet, but I'm going to do something. And then you remember, how many of you, when you're counting to three, you're trying to process, what am I going to do when I get to three? Like one, two, Something, you better stop because, and it's like four, five, like some of us are, are 10 counts because we, got, we need more time, you know. And it's not, it's not because we're giving our kids grace, it's because we need more time to think about what we're about to do when we get to the, the consequence, to the end of it. So, yeah, you didn't know you were going to learn parenting at, at uh, church today. 
But, but all of these things are into the Lord. So when it's of the Lord, and so I just want to think about this bigger. So if we go to work as unto the Lord, it's worship. When I go to school as unto the Lord, it's worship. In, in my private life, when I am doing whatever I do in private as unto the Lord, it's worship. When I come in public. So if I, when, I, when I am doing these things and it's, it's, it's unto the Lord, that's, that's the context that makes it worship. So your life, when your life is lived unto the Lord, everything you do can be worship unto him. So it's not just whatever you do, but whatever you do is unto the Lord. So I, I want to give you three things that describe a lifestyle of worship, because I believe you want one just like me. A lifestyle worship, it's our purpose. It's our very purpose. Purpose in the, in the church world is a very popular word. Uh, we use it a lot. There's lots of great books written on purpose, and it simply means it, it, it doesn't just speak to what you do. It speaks to who you are. And so worship isn't something we just does. Worship is who we is. Worship is... Worship isn't just an act, it, it's who we are, it's who we were created to be. And it's not just who we are as Christians, it's actually who you are as a human. You are, as a human being, you were created, your very existence is to worship and, and to honor the Lord. It's who we are. The Bible talks about worshipers as, as not just something we do, but it's, it's an identity, it's something that we identify with. I, I want to give you some scriptures, and, and you don't have to keep up with me on these. I just want to give you some context for how we were created for this on purpose. Colossians 1, 16, it says, In him all things, this is about Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. All of it, including you and I. Uh, Ephesians 1 uh, says, For he chose us, in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight to the praise of his glorious praise. He, he didn't just come to make robots. He came so that you would be transformed and that your life would be praise and worship uh, unto him. Revelation 4.11, it says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you have created all things and for your pleasure they were created. They are and were created. That, that we, you and I, you were created for his pleasure, to, to honor him, to lift him up. You were not created for his ego. God is not sitting on a throne and, and is in this ego trip that he just needs everything to, 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 to boost his ego. He is the same yesterday and today and forever whether you worship him or not. He is the savior of the world, whether you acknowledge that or not. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He is supreme, whether we acknowledge that or not. So it's not about an ego thing with God. God doesn't need your worship. You need your worship. Because worship's your purpose. And if we don't get this worship thing as a lifestyle settled, if worship is just confined to what we do in 20 minutes of, a, of singing or it's what we do in the mountain, mountaintops, not in the mountains, but, but on the mountaintops of life, if it's what only we do in the, in the worst of times or in tough times, then, then we are missing the purpose, worship, with every breath I breathe, with everything, I, my thoughts, the way I think, everything I put my hand to can be worship as unto the Lord. It's our purpose. It's what you were created for. All of heaven, thousands upon thousands upon ten thousands of angels are surrounded around the throne. John saw this in Revelation. God doesn't need your worship. He's got angels who worship. They, they were created to exalt him. But worship is not just exalting God because exaltation is something you give. Angels do that. There's this exchange that happens with worship. It's two-way, not one way. Everybody say that with me, two-way. So it's towards the Lord, but it's also something you receive from the Lord. There's this download that happens when we worship the Lord. So it's not just I'm boosting his ego, it's he's addressing your ego. <laughs> he, he's handling things in us as we worship. And then he, here's the next thing. So it's our purpose, but, but then it's a response. And this is where we're going to spend most of the time today. Worship is our response 
God reveals, we respond. God reveals, we respond. God is revealing himself today. Where is the measure of your response? This last week, God revealed himself in Tuscaloosa last night. The Lord God Almighty. The Lord, he reveals, he reveals himself. How are you responding? Worship is proportional. It's a proportioned response to what I am acknowledging God has done or is doing in my life. Or I'm acknowledging who he is. So you you watch somebody who's been Like you got people that are saved and then you got people that have really been saved. Anybody in the category like you've been really saved? Like he really had to come get you. You know what I'm saying? Like some of us are like, no, he didn't have to reach very far. Whatever. He, you know. (laughs) The people that don't think he reached very far, he's having to convince you that you you had to be saved just as much as everybody else had to be saved. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of playing around with words here. I'm not saying people are more saved than others, okay? But what I'm saying is our understanding sometimes. You, you watch somebody who, who uh, was once an addict, but their identity, well, once an addict, always an addict. Uh-uh, not when you bump into Jesus. He will slam into you so hard, he will change your identity. No, well, well, I... I I, uh, I struggle, uh, my anxiety, it ain't your anxiety. You better give it back to the devil who it belongs to. No, because, because once he, once you bump into Jesus, he, he hits you so hard, he will transform you into, it says, all things have been created new. The old is gone, the new has come. He transforms you into a new person. We see this biblically, man. He changes people's names. He changes their identity. So Paul says, I no longer identify with the dead life, with the old life. And so there's this thing that happens in salvation, and I can't help but respond in gratitude and thankfulness. I can't help but make sure my family's at church, not because I have to, but because I get to. Where else would I be but in the house of the Lord, worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to be religious so I get on God's good list I am he died to put me on his list when I could never be good enough to get there I came to church to preach today because somebody was lost somebody was blind somebody was crippled somebody couldn't get out of bed somebody didn't know which way to turn and Jesus showed up You went through AA and it didn't work. You did all the counseling. You read all the books. Like you did all the stuff. You worked your tail off. But still, you might have been more religious, but you didn't know Jesus anymore. And then in the midnight hour, the psalmist says, in the midnight hour. And and what was his response? What was David's response? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually. Y'all know what continually means in the Hebrew? It means that there will be no circumstance. There will be no uh, political administration. There will be no economy. There will be no sickness. There will be no disease. There will be nothing around me that will change who's in me. I have the greater one living inside of me. And so my worship will not be circumstantial. My worship will always be a response, not to how I feel, but to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, not to the volatility of this world and the changing seasons, but it will always be. I will bless the Lord at all times. When the kids submit and when they don't submit. When my team wins. And when they don't. Because ultimately, we are not team Republican, team Democrat, or team Independent, or, or team Alabama. Or team dog, like, ultimately, I understand it's temporary, but we have an eternal home. And we have one king, and we serve one king, and his name is Jesus. If you're not careful, 
your response is not a response at all. Your worship is more reactive than it is responsible. It's more, it's more of a, a reaction. So, so let me just ask you today, God is revealing, but how are you responding? How are you responding your, this week? Just look back at your last week. Well, no, brother, the past is behind me. Not for this point. But I just want you to be thoughtful and consider when you got the news, when you got the phone call, when you were dealing with that, when you had that dream, when that memory came up, when, when that conflict happened, when there wasn't necessarily submission to the Lord in your house, what was your response? And, and we can only be, we, we are response able. If, if we just live rea- able to respond, you break down that word. If we're only reactive to around, around us, our worship will be up and down. As long as everything's going good, we worship. But worship isn't about what's happening around us. It's about the one who lives in us. And, and I want to show you this. We're going to like go through, there's, a, there's just a list of stories in the Bible, and some of these will be familiar to you. For, for others, you're like, it might be new, and so I encourage you to look at the notes and, and go look at them. But this is the way God reveals and the people in the Bible responded. We're going to preach through the whole Bible right here. Are you ready? In about 60 seconds. When Abraham encounters God, he's called to Obedient sacrifice, it's an act of worship. When Moses leads the people out of Egypt it, it, so that they can worship the Lord, and then Miriam leads them in worship. When Judah is being attacked by the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Cellulites. Anybody been attacked by the Cellulites? <laughs> Je- Jehoshaphat sends out a choir before the army, and they worship. When Job loses everything, he falls to his knees in worship. When Elijah calls down fire from heaven, it's an act of worship. When David dances before the Lord, it's an act of worship. When David loses his son, he worships. So when Hannah hands over her baby son to the Lord, she sings a song of worship. When Mary knows that she's carrying Jesus, she worships. When the wise men greet the baby Jesus, they worship. When Simeon sees the infant Jesus, he worships. When the widow gives her might, all that she has, an offering to the Lord, she worships. When the sinful woman brings her most valuable possession, pours it at the feet of Jesus in an expression of love, she worships. When the disciples realize that Jesus is Lord, they worship him. And when Paul and Silas are in prison for casting out evil spirits out of a woman, they worship. They worship. This is what's fascinating. Out of all those things I just read, only one of them happened in a church. The rest of them were just in the mundane areas of life, just the ordinary areas of life. But in the ordinary, if you will acknowledge the extraordinary... It makes a place for worship. Hey, you might be today and you're like, Michael, I just came to church because this is kind of like my last stop. This is my last hope. Then worship. You might have got the phone call this week that was just like, man, I don't know how to do it. Worship. You may be a a business person in a place of indecision and you really need wisdom in this season. season. In this season, (laughs) worship. You may be in your second treatment of chemo. Worship the Lord. You may be just really wishing your kid would answer the phone. Just worship the Lord. You may be struggling. You hear about a, a, an encouragement about tithing and giving. You're like, you have no idea my financial circumstance. God does. Just worship him. Just worship the Lord. There is never a place in your life where it's not appropriate to worship. To worship. Because it's your purpose, but it's our response And I want to challenge you in a day where the world is more reactive than ever, worship him. Acknowledge the Lord. Don't don't follow the rhetoric or into the lie. Don't be distracted from your number one purpose. When you're a Christian, if you were to breathe your last breath, guess where you're going? Going to heaven. You're going to heaven. When you breathe your last breath, so the breath that you do use while you're still here, Use it to worship the Lord. Use it to, to honor the Lord. What does the enemy want? He, he can't get your soul because you're so, he can't get your spirit. You're going to heaven. So what will he, what, he, what does he do? He's not after 
your family. He's not after your bank account. He's not after your, your, like, your life like you would serve darkness or you would serve the enemy. It's not like that. He doesn't need servants. He doesn't need a family. He doesn't need your money. You know what he wants? Your worship. He'll distract us with the pureness of worship. It only belongs to the Lord. And, and you say, okay, so if worship is my response, how do I respond? How, how is my life a response to him? And I, I want to go back. There's an Old Testament scripture where the Lord is teaching the people of Israel how to be a people. They were in slavery for generations. They come out, and he even teaches them, I mean, how to do dishes, how to wash your clothes, how to take care of yourself. Like he is, if you've ever wondered why all this weird, it's like seems kind of like strange stuff. It's like he's teaching babies how to take care of themselves and teach, and he is. In essence, it's like raising kids in your house. He's teaching them how to be responsible. Well, one of the things that God teaches the people of Israel is how to worship. And he uses uh, this particular thing to teach them how to uh, worship in the morning and worship in the evening. But it wasn't just those particular times. It was a lifestyle of worship. So this is the Shema, S-H-E-M-A. A Shema, and it's actually the Jewish song. If those of you are traditional, uh, uh, familiar with Jewish tradition, they still do this today, practicing Jews. But it's found in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 through 5. And he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord is one God. So why was he emphasizing that? Because there was idolatry in the land. There was, a, there was worship of anything and everything. I know we kind of judge that and we go, how could you worship an idol? But we have idolatry even in our own culture that, that's, that, that shows up. And so it's significant. Like we have to, we have, the foundation of worship is on him. He is one God. But then he says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Some of you thought that was a New Testament scripture, and it is because we're going to land the plane there in just a minute. But before, thousands of years before Jesus ever taught this message, God was teaching what should be the bookends of our life, that we begin and we end a day with worship, that there is one God. And, and what is this in, in essence? Like if we could just describe what the scripture is, it is worship, but it's love expressed. It's an expression of love. Worship, in its, the, the, the purest response to worship is love expressed expressed. And I just want to ask you this, who loved who first? Did we love God first or did God love us first? Yeah. First John says that we love because he first loved us. So God first loved me and then what's my response? It's, it's this act of obedience, but it's this expression of love back towards the one who, who has loved me. So, so my obedience the song that I sing, wanting to look more like Jesus, wanting to do what his word commands and what he instructs, all of these things, they're not religious uh, in the sense that I'm trying to get right. They're an expression of love because he's made me right. So worship isn't I'm trying to get God to do something in my life. It's I'm worshiping in response because he loves me so much. How could I not bring the first and the best, tithe and give? How could I not bring my song to him? How could I not bring my service to him? How could I not honor my wife, die to myself and honor and serve my wife? I'm perfect at it. I never mess up. <laughs> but, but when, once in a blue moon, I do mess up, Instead of being prideful, who's ever heard of that? Arrogant, like you never mess up. Instead of that, I go, man, I, Lord, first and foremost, Lord, I, I apologize. I submit my heart to you. Even in uncertainty, well, I know I'm right. You know such thing, you can be dead right. You're right, but you're still dead. But, but there's this heart of submission before the Lord, this humility before him of, Lord, Lord, will you soften my heart before you, and then will you soften Amy's heart towards me? No. Will you soften my heart toward, guys, I'm getting real practical here about how we take worship out of just the song we sing on Sunday. And come on, let's glorify God in our marriage on Monday. Let's, let's in the way we serve and honor our kids, like it's very practical. And that's exactly what Jesus does. And this is where we're going to land the plane. So it's, it's our rightful purpose to worship. It's our response. It's love expressed. It's the Shema. 
And you were like, hey, what was that Shema word or that Shema? Or that, you know, and I don't know how I pronounced it in the first service. It changes. But, but what, what was the principle of that? It wasn't some religious thing. God was, God was saying, hey, you every single day, remember, start your day and end your day with knowing there is one God and I am he. And your rightful response is to love the Lord with all your, whole, all your heart, soul, might, and strength. And then Jesus takes it to a whole nother level. Listen, y'all, I love the Old Testament, but Jesus took it to a whole nother level. And what he did is he took worship out of, the, out of just the towards God, and he moves the Shema to worship being our mission. Worship is actually our, our mission in the way that we live our lives. Let me show you. He does this in all three of the synoptic, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the gospels that are the same. But then, and I wanna read the, the part in Matthew, Matthew 22, 37 through 39. It says, when they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? Like if, if there's, and this was kind of like what they were asking him. It's like, if there's one thing that you want us to do, what is it? Because this was, opposite of the hundreds of laws that Jewish tradition had. They literally had books and books of law. Y'all remember the Ten Commandments? Well, that's what God gave them to start with. They added hundreds and hundreds of other regulations. It's kind of like you men who go to the grocery store. She gave you ten things to get. You started with two of them, and then you got to the Little Debbie aisle. Anybody thankful for those Christmas trees that are coming in just a couple of, I mean, come on. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we honor you. We worship you right now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it's like, it's almost like he said, listen, guys, y'all can't remember very much. People, you can't remember. I'm going to give you 10. But then they added all this stuff. So then Jesus simplifies it even more because they're like, hey, we understand the Ten Commandments, but there have been hundreds of laws. Jesus, we've been busy. We got hundreds of laws to keep up with. And he's like, there's one. There's one, and then there's another one that's just like it. And this is what he says. He repeats to them the Shema. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. This is amazing to me. This was like the nugget that I found as I was getting ready for today. Because I, I realized, wow, Lord, you just took our kingdom purpose and you, you smashed it together with our kingdom mission. Because our purpose, the reason we exist in heaven and on earth is to worship. But when we worship here with every breath and in every season, when, when it's our, 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 our proportion response to his goodness and what he's done, then what begins to happen? It's my mission. He, he equates, he puts together the two commandments of loving God and loving people together and says, this is the way to live your life, to love others and to love yourself. And I think for me, I'm not gonna put this on you, but I sometimes compartmentalize my worship. And I say, man, I'm good with the Lord, but man, I got some things with people that aren't too good. And sometimes I, I feel like my affection or really worship is actually, actually what I do with God. But worship said it's not just between you and God, it's between you and other people. Worship is actually service. We see this in Romans 12.1. Some of you are going to be familiar with this scripture. God says, uh, Paul says, through God says through Paul. In light of his mercy, in light of everything that Jesus has done, he says, I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And he says, this is your reasonable act of worship. Your reasonable act of worship. That word worship right there, it's the second most popular use of the word worship in the Bible. You know what it means? Service. How you serve one another. So not just on Sunday, after we're done singing or after we're done coming to church. But when I go to work Monday, I'm on mission. The worship leader is not the person up here that leads the song. The worship leader is the Christian at work or at school or in a tough situation that isn't, not as, is not reactive to what's happening around them, but instead responds to the one that lives in them and makes a place to acknowledge God and serve other people. This is this beautiful picture of how are we 
if we say we worship God, how are we loving our neighbor? We say we're, 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 we love the Lord, but what are we posting about the person who doesn't have the same political views as us? Or, or the team that we played in Tuscaloosa last night? Or the person right now at work that just really gets on our nerves? You know, God loves that person just as much as they love you. Or the way we withhold forgiveness sometimes. Like, we, we compartmentalize our worship. And worship is transformative in nature. You just, you can't be around the Lord and have this vertical place with Him and it not extend in the way we love and we treat other people. So I want to ask you today, in a way of asking about your worship, how's your service? What's your service look like? You've been married 10 years. What's your service look like to your spouse? What's your service look like to your boss and to the organization that, that has the name on the check? Well, I don't owe them a thing. I, I've given them. Hang on a second. How's, how's your service? The, Jesus even takes it this far. He goes, how are you serving your enemy? Block, block, block. <laughs> block, 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 block. Social media has made it so nice. Can you still, will they see that you blocked them? Because I, I want to be a closet blocker. Like I'm blocking you, but I don't want you to know that I blocked you because I don't want to see your stuff. You know, you know see what I'm saying? It's like, guys, we're believers. We're in a higher place. Like, like there's a higher calling and a higher, we're called to be worshipers. And in the same sentence, Jesus connects worship to our mission and how we love people. And I just, I was thinking about as a church, let it, don't let it be said that we just sing big songs, that we sing loud, that, that we dance or we, we jump on, we get excited. Don't, don't let that be the essence of our worship. Let how it transforms us into those who aren't here yet. To serve those who aren't here yet. To, to not just worship, declare him on, on Sunday, but then forget our neighbor on Monday. Or to, to allow conflict to rest in our house. Or to allow these things that are happening in interpersonal relationships. Man, I just think, if, I think this is like the message today that the Lord would just say, if you're worshipers, let's act like it. Let's really let it live out in our lives. And, and I recognize that this may hit us in different places. But here's how I want us to, to, to be challenged today. Some of you today have been more reactive than responsive. And God's calling you back to a place to respond to Him, to, to look to Him right in the middle of the situation. Just like in those desperate times in the Bible, the most powerful thing you can do is worship and acknowledge the Lord right in the midst of that. Is it gonna fix the problem? The problem is gonna fix, is gonna be fixed. May it happen, will it happen right away or in the way you, that, that's, not, that's not the focus. The focus is I'm setting my attention on the Lord. And then, and then some of you, like me, we have compartmentalized the song we sing from the life we live in light of how we serve people and we love people around us. I mean, there is a calling on your life to love the unlovable, to surround people that, that have no one. We talk about this as a church that we exist for those who aren't here yet. So how does worship look on Monday? How will it work for you this week, this season of your life? I wanna end with this, this quote from Tim Hughes. And uh, he, he's a worship leader, but he describes how worship isn't a position or something we do in a certain setting. It's who we are everywhere we go and the way we serve others. He said, God empowers and equips us to make a difference in and in true worship, we worry less about how we feel or whether we're being blessed and instead prepare to be led away from ourselves to the place where we are desperate to see the transformation of society. And there, serving the poor and sharing our best with those clothed in pain and despair, we discover that Jesus is already there. Listen, Jesus came to church and we need to, but Jesus was more than just a church goer. He carried that love and that service everywhere he went. And I believe it's a mandate. It's, God, it's what God's calling you and I to in a bigger way than ever before. Will you bow your heads and you close your eyes? Father, I just pray right now over every heart, every mind. God, we thank you for the higher calling to worship you. God, I thank you that you're reminding us today that it's our purpose 
that it's a response. Lord, I pray right now over those that are in a season right now where it just feels natural to react, maybe in anger or confusion or frustration. And God, I just thank you that today you're just stopping us in our tracks and, and you're, you're where we feel powerless. You're saying, no, 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 you, you have power, worship me. And so today we just choose to respond and we're acknowledging you, God. We're expressing our love towards you. God, I, I pray for the person who is just frustrated spiritually, that just really needs a breakthrough in their life. God, I thank you that today you're, you, are just, you are meeting them right where they are and they're simply responding in faith, responding in worship. And Lord, I pray over our church and over the way we carry ourselves to our jobs and our families that worship wouldn't just be what we do on Sundays, but God, that we would serve and be an extension of your kingdom everywhere we go. That we would live out the Shema, that it would be the bookends of our life, the way we begin, the way we end, and everything in between. So Lord, we just submit this time before you to respond to you, to respond to your word and however you're speaking to us. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just ask you if you'll continue to pray and worship and focus on the Lord personally. But I wanna to talk to those of you who may not have a relationship with Jesus. We never wanna close out a service without giving you the opportunity to begin a relationship with Jesus or to, to start back and start have, have a fresh start. Everybody needs that. And, and today that might be you. You may be far from God and today you, you wanna come close to him and you need to understand when we couldn't get to him, he came to us. Jesus really did come 2,000 years ago and he lived a perfect life and he lived a perfect death. And that death bridged the gap between us and God. There was no other way to get to God or get to heaven without him. So he's done all the work, but the Bible says that we have to respond to him in faith. We have to choose him today. And that's what I'm asking you about. Today, do you wanna choose Jesus? Do you wanna make him the Lord of your life? Or do you need a fresh start and to come back to him? We're not gonna embarrass you or call you out. We're not gonna make you say anything. This is really between you and God. I have my eyes open and I'm looking around because I just wanna, I wanna lead you in a prayer of committing your life to Jesus. If that's you, you wanna meet him for the first time or come back to him, you'll just slip your hand up and put it right back down. Right now, you can put it up. Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you, way to go. Hands all over this room. Praise God, praise God. I see you, brother, way to go, way to go. Just a few more seconds, you wanna join these others? So proud of you. Wow, what a day. Your eternity changed. All the old is gone. No more guilt, no more shame. You're a new person. New person. Not because you're good, but because he's so good. I wanna give you some words to pray. You just pray this in your heart, but you, I want you to pray it with all of your heart like he's standing right there, because he is. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Jesus, I believe you're real. I believe that you came and you died on the cross for me, that you really love me and you want a relationship with me. So today I surrender my heart for the first time, or today I come back to you, Lord, for a fresh start. I want you to be very first in my life. And I thank you that when I breathe my last breath, I'm going to heaven. I'll see you face to face in the place that you created for me. But I thank you that right now I, I get to live this life worshiping you, knowing you, walking with you. Thanks for bringing me to this place today so that I could know you, so that my eternity could be changed, but today could be changed for me forever. I love you. Thank you so much for loving me. In your name I pray, amen.